of Inside Great Lakes Sailing. My name is Greg Norman. We are uh, fortunate enough to have with us today uh, a gentleman from the Benton Harbor, St. Joe area, Dave Topping. And we're not going to take you on a we're not going to take you on a journey about somebody's background in sailing. We're going to take you on a story about the boat sitting behind me and kind of talk about the history of the boat. And first of all, Dave, thank you for coming aboard. And that's <laughs> using boating terms. I appreciate you sitting down talking with us. You were, for about 15 years, the owner of a boat called Serenade. Is that, that correct? Is true. That's correct, yes. Beautiful. And time. the history of this boat, which if you've watched the show, you, you, you saw the first five or six minutes of the show already, you know its history. It was, it was commissioned in 1938. It was commissioned by. Uh, well, go ahead. Talk just briefly. Talk about the the, the history of the, the the beginnings of the boat. Well, it was built out in Wilmington Boatyard out in Los Angeles, and um, it was built for Yasha Heifetz. Now, Yasha Heifetz was a world class violinist from Russia, and he wanted a, this boat. And it's a very unique boat. It, it's it's unusual. It's a world class yacht. Let's make it just simple as that. And uh, he had it built and. I, in 2009, I wanted to see where this Wilmington boatyard was, you know, how you want to do those kind of things. And so my wife and I, Peggy, we went out to Los Angeles and I looked around. I finally found Wilmington and I looked all over. I talked to a lot of old sailors there. They said, well, we remember the boatyard, but we don't know wherever, where it is now. And uh, so I walked around and looked around and couldn't find. So I thought there's no better place than going to a fire station. Those guys know where everything is. So I went into the fire station. I said, I'm looking for the old Wilmington boat yard. He says, you've come from the right places in our backyard. So they took me right out there. And of course, it's just the old pilings left. But I just wanted to see where it all began. And it, uh, the boat itself is uh, most unusual. Well, the boat you're, we're talking about was, was commissioned as a race boat to race between Newport and Ensenada. Is that correct? Back in 38? Right. It was an N-class yacht. N-class. It went from, uh, so I, I always have a problem saying his name, Yasha Heifetz? Yasha Heifetz, yes. Yasha, okay. He was actually considered one of the best violinists in the first 50 years of the last century, which I thought was pretty interesting. It was, yes. It went from there, I believe the Gabor sisters had their fingers in it, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. But let's back up a little bit. Yasha Heifetz had a, a multitude of friends that loved to sail with him. One of them was Humphrey Bogart. Those two yeah. guys were really buddies, and they used to race that boat and had a great time until Humphrey bought his own boat, which was called True Love. But uh, it, it, the, the history of it is, is unbelievable. And, of course, uh, I can remember one time I read that his wife got after him because we had running backstays on that boat. They were all big brass running backstays, and they could clip your fingers if you weren't careful. And she was so concerned, and he told her, Honey, she said, he said, I've got each finger insured for a million dollars. 
I think we'll get along just fine here. That was his attitude. In, in doing some research, I found out the Yassa Heifetz actually had learned to sail on the Black Sea. His family had been sailors, and that's where his love of this. So the, he wasn't, when he built the boat, he wasn't a novice. He wasn't just a guy with money and a, and a, and a worldwide reputation as a musician. He was actually a, a pretty good sailor. Oh, yes. And, and this, he, was a, this was a fast boat for its time. It really it was. was. And, and he used to take Einstein with him also. Yeah. I can just throw names at you. I used to do that all the time. It was fun. But, but there's no proof about any of this, you know. Uh, after 70 or 80 years, it, it all flows together. But you, he sailed with a lot of interesting people. And you're, you're right. Mark Einstein from the pizza company or Albert Einstein? The uh, Albert great. Einstein. Okay. I was, I'm joking. <laughs> I know who you are. But Albert was quite a sailor himself. Well, the, 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 boat, the boat has had history. From, it went through a number of folks. Uh, uh, Jacques, Jacques Cousteau's son, Philippe, owned it for yes. a while. Mm -hmm. It had, right. been, had been through that family. He had taken it on a number of, you know, number of I think, around the world trips, if I'm not mistaken. Everything. I, I, the reason I know about that is uh, I used to teach school and he used to have a lot of programs on TV back in those days. And uh, the kids would come to school every now and then and say, hey, coach, I mean, we saw your boat on TV last night and they had squids all over the top of your cabin cutting them up. So you never know. Well, part of the beginning of this show is that we've kind of talked about the history and, and where it's gone and, and where the boat's gone. And. It is now in uh, the French Riviera. It's for sale for just under a million dollars. They put a bunch of money into it to re you know, reconfigure it and, and do all kinds of stuff. It's for sale. It's had an interesting history. So what I'd like to do, Dave, is sort of start with you. Everybody, and again, I, I certainly don't mean any disrespect, but everybody that's been a part of this boat has had some notoriety, whether it was um, music or whether it was government or whether it was geography or an industry you were a school teacher from uh the southwest part of michigan Correct. and all of a sudden a boat that has a history that is as good as any boat history i've ever heard of ends up in your hands so sort of take us through where did it start for you with this boat well you know like all things in life uh my wife and i are the type of people that take risks now and then so and these risks you try to find your dream and sometimes dreams get away from you. In this case, it did. Uh, to tell you, this went to Eva Gabor too next. And, and Peggy, my wife, she uh, wrote her a letter and, and, and she wrote back and she remembered the boat. Her husband gave it to her for a birthday party for a present. And she remembers, she's, you know, honey, she said, I don't remember too much. So I was so young then. She said, but we did use the boat. We sailed out to Catalina Island quite often. And it was a beautiful sailing boat. She loved it. And so from there, it went to Jacques Cousteau. And then it traveled on. And, and funny thing, Jacques Cousteau, when we had the boat in Newport, Rhode Island for one summer, he came aboard and looked around. Of course, I wasn't there, unfortunately. Things like that happen to me every now and then. The thing about owning this boat, in my case, we met some of these people. And he was aboard for about five minutes. And my crew told me about it. And... Uh, he just kind of looked at Orr, see if it's still in good shape, and brought back memories of his son because his son got killed in a in a helicopter crash, and so Fully. he left. And not long after that, uh, when I was restoring the boat, when it had some problems at times, uh, I had a young man with me. Just another simple story of how this boat can bring people into your life. And his grandmother said, "I'd like to take my son." We were in West Palm Beach fixing the boat up, and my she said. I would like to take my grandson out to lunch. And I said, fine, go ahead. And uh, so they went out to lunch and I thought this is great. And he came back and, and he was so excited to be with his grandmother. And he, she brought an old friend with her. And her old friend was just so excited about the serenade and asked him all kinds of questions. He chattered with him and told him about the boat, what we were going to do. And he said, it was a fun, fun lunch. And I said, I'm, I'm happy about that. And uh, I could have gone, of course, but... Uh, he said, well, anyway, it was a fun time. And I said, well, who were you talking to? He, oh, he says, I was all talking to some old singer, he said. I said, did he have a name? He said, yeah, it was Perry Como. Mm -hmm. So I messed out there. Anyway, this happened to me a multitude of times. I'm missing good people. at the, But the boat attracts people. That's the story in itself. Uh, first of all, you got to understand that uh, 
I have an unusual wife. You have to have a wife that likes your dreams and goes along with him. So this is how we'll start this out. Now, I'm 85 years old, and she's, I shouldn't say, but she's 83, and we've been doing this kind of stuff for years, dreams, and a little risk here, a little risk there. But now, I come home one time, and I say to Peggy, I said, I have found a boat that maybe we can sell our house and uh, live on it. It was a William Hand motor sailor. It was a beautiful boat. And so Peggy said, well, let's go down to Florida and take a look at it. So that's what we did. We went to Florida, took the kids. Of course, they were all happy. It was during Christmas break. We were both teaching school at the time. Peggy was a librarian. I was a woodshop teacher and a football coach. And so we went down to Florida for the Christmas break. Kids went to the beach, and we all went out to see this William Hand. Unfortunately, nobody liked it but me. So there was a dream that was gone. So now what we're doing is Peggy and my son Hank and my daughter Hillary and Heidi, they went to the beach. Hank went with his mother shopping, and I'm sitting in the motel by myself. So I get out and look, look around. I start walking on the docks. And lo and behold, there the serenade was sitting. Now, this is where? This is in uh, Fort Lauderdale. How did, it, how, did it end up in, how did it end up in Florida? Well, we were down there for the spring break. We, we like to go to Florida in, in the winter. And uh, uh, most all beautiful boats at one time or another possibly sail through Fort Lauderdale. Okay. But she was sitting there. And I was dumbstruck. I've never, I mean, I've been restored a lot of wooden boats as a, I'm 48, 49 years old at this time. And I've seen a lot of wooden boats that I've restored. I looked at the fine lines. That's all part of it when you're in, in the boats. You've got to understand what boats are worth saving and ones that let go. And when I saw the serenade, it was unbelievable. I walked up and down that dock for a half hour looking at that boat, and I was just struck by it. Okay, and Mike, all of a sudden, my, my, question, sudden, my yes. question for you is, how did the boat end up in Florida? Well, Philip Caymans took it down to Florida. He was one of the owner at the time, and he was going to charter it. So he left it down there. And uh, by the time I'm standing there for about a half hour, pretty soon the broker came out. He says, you kind of like that boat, don't you? I said, that's not a boat. That's a yacht. And I said, I want to, I, I like to look at it. He said, no problem. Take your shoes off and we'll go aboard. And we went aboard. And, and every place I looked, I mean, we had a winding staircase going down off the left. Here was a nice bronze fireplace. I mean, wherever you looked, it was magnificent. And I, I, I just couldn't get over it. I mean, the, the stern was a canoe stern. And I don't mean just a slop those shoes. This thing was beautiful. I can still remember in big waves going across the boat and peeling off that stern. It was a gorgeous thing to watch when I was Well, you can, you can see the stern right behind me here. Correct. Correct. You can. And uh, this boat was built by uh, Nicholas Potter. He was what they called the Hershoff of the West Coast. He built a lot of lovely crafts, but this is probably one of his best. Okay. And he did his studying under Hershoff on the East Coast. So this man knew what he was doing. But he built this boat in 1938, and uh, I was going crazy. And I, I asked the broker, I says, I know it's for sale, and I'm just a poor old school teacher, but what's the price? He says, it's, it's going maybe for 285000 I said, oh, that's wonderful. And I said, boy, what a lot of thing it would be to buy that. He says, why don't you make an offer? <laughs> I said, make an offer? I mean, you got to realize where I'm coming from. I can't be making an offer on a boat like this. He says. You make an offer. I don't care what it is. I will take the blunt of it. I said, well, I don't want to embarrass anybody. So I made him an offer. I said, I'll go home and sell my house, sell all the boats I have, sell my car. I won't sell my wife, but I'll sell you everything else I have. And so we went home at Christmas. I made an offer. See, we went home for Christmas. And the day after Christmas, he called. I don't understand it, but he said, came and took your offer. He says, the reason we think it happened was the United States in 19, this is 1982, 1981, was in kind of a little recession. Not a big one, but a little bit. Uh, we think he needs a little crunch of money. He has a, 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 a villa over in Switzerland that he's also got for sale, which everyone goes first. So he took your offer. He says, now you got to get down here and uh, let's get this thing surveyed and go out for a trial sale and see if you really want it. So again, 
we took the family down to Florida. And of course, the girls were thrilled to death to get a little more sunshine, get nice and brown. And my wife, come to think, I don't think my wife went down a second time. And my son stayed home too. He was just 11 years old or so. But so the girls and I went down there. And I took the boat off for sale, had it surveyed beautifully, of course. And it had been restored. About every 20 years, you have to restore a yacht like this, or it, it will die, you know. But it had been restored, and it looked beautiful. It passed easily. And so after about two or three days down there, I was sitting there, and the, yoke, the broker came up and said, Now, Dave, tomorrow, I want to know what you're going to do. Are you going to buy this boat? And I said, I didn't give him an answer. And he said, we got people waiting in line. Might want to buy this boat. What are you going to do? So the next morning, I got up and sat on the side of the bed. And I sat there and I thought for a while, what am I going to do? Then it hit me. Do I want to be 84 years old like I am now, or 85, and think I almost bought the serenade? No way in the world. I'm going to buy it right now. And I did. And that's when the venture started. Okay, so this is February of... This is December of 1982. 1982. So at this point now, you have to put up your house for sale. It's gone. You got, <laughs> Okay, so... At some point, you got to bring the boat north. That's let me let me let me ask a backup question. Sure. When you spent this half hour, the first time you put your eyes on this boat, did you pretty much know that whatever it was going to take to buy it, you were going to do it? I couldn't dream that far ahead. I okay. Two hundred eighty-five thousand dollars was beyond my imagination. Okay. Beyond. So but, I, when I look at a Ferrari, I'd like to buy one, but it's it's just not going to happen. I get it. I hear you. And, I get it. And I've done that too. That's another one of my dreams and hobbies. Now, we won't go there. We have had a, we, my wife is unbelievable. Here comes the husband home with this dream of living on a boat that you probably can't afford. Did it? <laughs> no question. Did it, did it occur to you as the, I'm guessing, the brains of the outfit? <laughs> did it occur to you that this wasn't, was probably a, a pipe dream? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I because if what is it, it done now? Well, <laughs> if you're living on a boat in Michigan in June, it's fabulous. But if you're selling your house and having to move to the boat as your residence, no. it gets a little chilly in December and January. Yes, I don't know that we were really thinking about moving onto the boat. Uh, okay, maybe he was. I wasn't. <laughs> Not right. totally That's fair. Sure. That's fair. So, we had to decide what we were, how we were going to be able to do this. Yeah. So, did you sell your house? Oh, we were always selling houses. How long have we lived here in this city? Forty-seven years. Forty-seven years, and I don't how many houses have we lived. Fourteen or fifteen. Yeah, we've lived in a lot of houses. Fourteen or fifteen, we have lived in and sold. So that wasn't anything new. Are you the um? What's the word I'm looking for? Are you the grounding agent in this relationship to make sure that everything kind of gets yeah, back to the I would to say it? that I am, yes, very definitely. <laughs> so you get this, you have this boat, you have this idea that you're going to, you know, buy this boat that's sort of out of your price range. You obviously must have come around at some point. What was the, what was the final selling point for you? Oh, he's a good talker. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> I don't really know. I, I'm sure I was going to sleep over it, but I... I finally came around and said, well, it sounds like a good adventure. So we did it. Okay. Wife has decided that this is a dream that's going to happen. You have to figure out a way to finance it. You obviously do a really good job at selling yourself and, and the projects you love. What was your thought in February of buying a boat you couldn't afford? Your wife just mentioned that, you know, she said, well, we'll figure out how to weigh it work. Did you think about moving on it? What, where, where were you at at this point is I guess what I'm wondering. Well, it, it all gets back to how Peggy and I live. It, it's just that way. When she, she mentioned homes, we've lived in 15 or 16, 17 homes. We bought them and fixed them up. When we got married back in the 60s, I bought her a home, the first one, for $23,000. And I thought I'd never get out of debt. Well, at risk takers we are. We buy houses and fix them up and sell them. Uh, we are retired school teachers living in a million-dollar home now. So. Sometimes risk pay off. Okay. However, let's get back to the serenade. Yes. She saw the boat and she was fascinated just like I was. Right. And when we got home, 
and we talked about moving on board the boat. You know, we have three kids, Heidi, Hillary, and my son, Hank, and to put high school kids on a boat and be five of us, that's a big boat, but it's not that big. So I said, here's what we'll do. When we get home, we'll mortgage the boat and go buy a house. So that's what we did. You know, when you're a school teacher, you know, as, as Trump and Obama know, school teachers don't make money, nor do firemen, nor policemen. And so we, we were just, just school teachers. We didn't make a whole lot of money. And, but my father was a fireman, so I knew where that was coming from. Okay. And so she went, I told her, go out and find a house. Well, she wasn't gone 15 minutes. She came back and said, I found a house for her. So that took care of that problem. Now, first problem, of course, is we have to bubble this boat because we're in ice water. And uh, so we, we just bubbled it when we got back home with it. So when you brought it back, you brought it, you came right back up with it in February or March. Did you come back to no, the interview? No, we no. went back in the, in the, in the summer. And uh, we went to, to uh, the Spencer Boatyard in West Palm Beach. That's where we had it at the time. And uh, we had to get it ready to come back, and we did. And, we sailed it from there to Newport, Rhode Island. Now, the, the boat sails beautifully, gorgeous. And we were right out on the Atlantic Ocean going down or going with the Gulf Stream. And we were doing a wonderful job. But after a while, the winds die. And um, then we had to motor. Well, now this is a 1938 craft. And when you start using the machinery, things happen. They break down. And you just don't go into a normal marina and say, I need this part to the serenade. Everything had to be done in the machine shop and so it was a battle getting along the way but we got to Newport Rhode Island and we kept it there and uh, we kept it by a, a lobster place where they brought the lobsters in and they kept breaking up the water and so the boat sat there all winter without any problem and the next summer we sailed it from there through New York up the Hudson River a wonderful trip in the Erie Canal okay and then into Lake Erie and then on around to St. Joe when you looked at this boat for the first time and knowing it was 50 or 60 years old, I mean, it had history, it was wooden, you had some background, but did it not occur to you that things were going to break on this boat at some point? Well, that's was that the just thing. hoping yeah. more hope than anything else? Well, I understand what you're saying there, but you know, anything worthwhile in this world doesn't come perfect. You have to improve it yourself. And that's what I do. I've been re redone a lot of boats re you know just done and i do it with cars i cars and airplanes i fly and i have sports cars and i had electric trains a big electric i have a lot of hobbies but you have to take what you get and improve upon it and that's what we did with the serenade okay all right now you get the boat back to michigan you obviously are going to sail it it's 60 some odd foot yacht creates marina problems did that how do you get what do you think about in St. Joe's with a 60-foot yacht? Is that something that even was a problem? No, St. Joe is a lovely harbor. Uh, you'd be surprised what Michigan has for boats and harbors. A beautiful, beautiful, beautiful area, beautiful time to sail in this area. Uh, we had a 65-foot slip waiting for it, so it was no problem there. And uh, we thought we started it, we wanted to charter it because, you know, okay. I could charter it, and that got – the money off the problem. You understand money and time are interesting things. Uh, money, when spent, can be replaced, replenished most of the time if you're not a school teacher anyway. But time, when spent on this serenade, that's gone forever. And now I'm looking back at that time right now. And uh, so we put some food out on that boat and decided we'd charter it, take a little pressure off the household. And people walk by and what is going on? They, we, there's no chartering around it. That's not happened before. And they right. saw this gorgeous boat. And this boat, I mean, this, this boat was far superior. I mean, I, was, I had a lot of friends in boating. And, and I would go to wooden boat shows. And usually my boats won best to show. But when I showed up with this thing, this boat, they said, Dave, you're not going to be in the, the show. You're going to be the judge. And that's how this boat was so far superior to anything. People, people would come and look at that boat, take it. That was probably the most photographed boat in Lake Michigan at that particular time. Did you charter to afford the boat or did you charter because you wanted to start a business? Both. Okay. And 
So it was an insurgent part business. of it. We call, mm -hmm. we call it a business. Serenade Yacht, Yacht Chartering Company. And it was LLC. And okay. uh, it, it, that, so that it, really it, helped. It was a necessity to some extent. Oh, by all means, it was a necessity. Okay. Well, but but you I'll tell you, the boat, what I really want to tell you here, how this boat, people admired this boat and looked at it. They had, you know, Michigan had really not seen. There's a lot of gorgeous yachts in, on Lake Michigan. But world-class yachts, not so many. And people would take pictures of that. But I want to tell you, the finest, the most perfect compliment this boat has ever gotten. It happened in Chicago at the Montrose Harbor. And sitting on a dock was an African-American man who had been who was a fisherman. And he sat there for years watching the boats come and go, hundreds of them. Now, when the serenade sailed by him, he stood up and he says, now that's a gosh dang boat. Right there. He knew immediately there was something special there. And did, you, did. did you charter the very first year? I'll t <laughs> you bringing up some real memories now. The first year we just charted very, just four or five times with friends and so forth to kind of get the feel because people really didn't know what it was. In right. the spring, we hauled the boat out to paint the bottom. They picked it up and took it back to the back of the yard, and the snap on the strap underneath it snapped and dropped the boat on blacktop, which went sank in about eight inches and snapped the mast right off. Oh. Now that is the worst thing any sailor can witness to see the mast snap off. This is an eighty-five foot mast made of Sitka spruce. How in the world am I going to get that repaired in Michigan? I mean, I could go out east, but how am I going to get on? I found a man by the name of Chip Stoolin up and. Sutton's Bay, Michigan. He says, he builds boats. He says, give me that challenge. He says, I'll come down, take that thing. I watched him cut it up in 10 foot sections and took it up to Sutton's Bay. And he says, where am I going to get the wood? Well, in Traverse City at that time, a piano company went out of business. They had a thousand square feet of Sitka spruce. How beautiful is that? He built a new mast for me, took all the brass off and polished it up. And it was beautiful. And we we're off in sailing. However, the summer's gone, so I couldn't charter. The next summer, we started chartering, and it worked beautifully. We, I sailed it at least 70 times a summer, and that is beautiful to take your boat out 70 times to sail it. Dave, what was the cost of a charter in those days, 1980 money? Okay, it was $350 for a three-hour sail. Wow, that's expensive. Well, we take 20 people. The Coast Guard let me take 20, 20 people out and four crew and myself. Was that three hundred and fifty a piece? No, no, three hundred and fifty for the boat. Oh, so so somebody okay. So instead so of usually it was companies that would take right. The, okay, you know, I get you. Or I churches. Get, that's a whole different. Yeah. That's not. So if you right. can bring that's that's a very and, that's and very. We, 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 we took people. We had weddings. Right. We had, we had uh, funerals. We had all kinds of things on that boat, and we, uh, it was beautiful. And people just never forgot it. And it, it was a, it was it was a good time and uh, as far as far as you know was that the first time the boat was used for that kind of commercial use well probably most everybody else it was their private boat and they had millions and they they could do what they wanted to see that's the thing about a boat like that uh, i'll tell you real quickly if you have that kind of money you take the boat in and you you write down what you want done and the boat yard takes care of it and then you write pay the bill in my case I did it a little differently. I taught wood shop, so I got the boys in the shop that were the best students I had and showed them how to maintain a wooden boat. And then in the spring, I'd teach them how to sail that boat. And so I had my crew, and you gotta remember, a crew makes the captain. Right. And, and they also learned how to take care of a boat. The only time I ever had trouble with them is when we pull into port and the girls would be lined, all the high school girls would be lined up. I said, boys, the boat comes first. Then you go see your girlfriends. But other than that, they were perfect. Okay. Um, interesting enough, what was the – okay, talk a little bit about the boat and its sailing. How many crew – how big a crew did you typically have when you sailed it? And I'm not talking about charters now. Just uh, yeah. for, for just a, a normal kind of race, how big was your crew? Well, let's put it this way. I sailed it by myself. A 60-foot boat. Right. All you had to do is take, keep 10 minutes ahead of yourself. But okay. you go in perfect conditions, of course. But I just wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. 
And okay. I did. So doesn't answer my question. I had how many? How many? Four. I usually like to have four boys on board. Okay. And, uh, and and I'd have a first mate and three sailors, and uh, they could handle that beautifully. And uh, then sometimes I say three hundred fifty dollars. Sometimes uh, the food and the booze that was on that boat was more than three hundred fifty dollars. It's all how it was handled. And uh, this was something new in the Great Lakes. And uh, we'd go over to Chicago. We'd go up to Holland. We'd go to wherever. In a, oh, one time uh, they said, Dave, come on up to Traverse City. We are going to have a governor's conference up here, and we'd love for you to bring the boat up. I said, well, that's, a, that's about 250 miles, 300 miles. I said, I don't know if I can take that much time off my chartering. And they said, well, we're bringing Dennis Connor to sail it for you. I said, I'm on my way. Because, you know, here's the he just had won the America's Cup in 86, and we were on our way up there. And he's my hero. And so we got up there, and he was up perfect guest he sailed a boat showed me some things and was very good with the crew and he was a pleasure to have on board and uh, we all learned something and that's what it was all about and uh, and and when we got back we docked the boat and we enjoyed ourselves up there and it was a fun time for everyone and then we back to work again talk a little bit about the boat's sailing characteristics what was it was it good downwind was it good off wind what was it what was the, what was the best conditions for the boat to sail in well we sailed one time from Chicago to Chicago, which is 60 miles. And we were getting a wind off our core back quarter, a good strong wind, and, and the waves were going that way. And we were just traveling. We were going at 19 knots, and it was pegged. We couldn't even tell how much faster we were going. Anyway, we sailed across, and we got into Chicago in four hours. Beautiful. Okay. My question was, what, what's the, in terms of sailing characteristics, was it a good off wind? Was it a good downwind? Was it, was it a... It was good everywhere. There was never anything that we had any problem with. Okay. I mean, we even saw tornadoes out there and we sailed around it. This thing, you could do anything you wanted with it. It's up to how clever the captain was. And uh, it was interesting when we had Dennis Conner because we were sailing. I remember Dennis one thing. And he told me, I was sailing at the time, he said, Dave, there's a little shadow over there. You go over to that shadow, and I think we'll pick up a knot or two. And so enough, I slid over, and a knot or two, we got faster. So it all depends on who's sailing. And that's another thing, too, I, I should bring up. When we have this boat, we share it with everyone. Uh, now, that's the thing my wife says. The thing that you're talking now, she says, now, when you get talking to Greg, you be careful. You share everything. But don't brag. There is a very close line from sharing with people and bragging into people. And we got to be careful. But I let everybody sail it. How would you like it if you're somebody's wife and living in Chicago or someplace and you're standing behind that wheel sail, sailing the, the most gorgeous boat in the area and you're going along about 14 knots? How can it get any better? Where's she going to go from there? And we share that with everybody. Everybody's sailing. What was your favorite part of the boat? You shouldn't ask that. Why? <laughs> I'll tell you. Uh, it had three staterooms, three heads, and a galley, a big galley, and a refrigerator, and a big stove. And it oh, had let me, let me, was let me nice ask you a better question. Okay. What was your what was the what was your favorite part of the boat? Put it that way. What did you enjoy the most on that boat? What was the thing that made you the happiest? Maybe just looking at it. I don't know. I'm just asking. Stepping on board was my favorite thing. That <laughs> boat never moved when you stepped on board. And that was because wherever I went on that boat, I was in heaven. Were people taken back by having a fireplace on a sailboat? Oh, yes. Yes. I mean, they couldn't believe it. And uh, uh, we didn't use it very often because the Coast Guard frowned upon that. But, well, I, uh, I asked the question. There's a, last year, there was a boat in the, in the Port here in the Mackinac race. 115 footer that had been built that was brought in just for the race, the biggest boat ever raced in the Mac, and it had a fireplace on it. I had never seen a fireplace on a sailboat. It just didn't compute in my brain that you could, you know, burn wood on a wooden boat. Right. And turns mm -hmm. out that that was, and this was something they'd built uh, like 1938. Sure. Uh, it it's all gets down to maintenance and recreation. And uh, if you maintain a boat like that, you have to work on it every day, and if anything goes wrong, 
that boat's going to die. And if that boat dies, so does your dream. So you have to be careful. Was the, fireplace, was the fireplace functional or for heat or was it just for decorative? It was functional. We put charcoal in there every now and then. And okay. that kind of heat sucks the heat, uh, sucks the air out of that boat and it creates a much better warm environment. Now, don't get me wrong. We didn't use it very often because uh, – <laughs> Having a fireplace on a wooden boat isn't exactly the no, best place. And, and I don't want to. I don't want to waste a lot of time talking about a fireplace. I well, just that's okay. It's unusual. Find it unique that a, that a that a boat of this caliber would have, you know, something like that. I'm sure it has a variety of of other things. The sales on this boat was would have probably cost a fortune, and by today's money, well, it didn't cost me a fortune because I couldn't afford to buy them. Uh, we had a main and a hundred. 50, 180 jib, and we had two spinnakers, beautiful spinners. I mean, I used to lay them out in my backyard to, you know, clean them up and so forth. They would cover my whole backyard. And uh, these, these sails were huge. And to replace them, of course, they got replaced when I sold the boat. The man that bought it restored it. it, was, it was after, I had that boat for almost 16 years. Yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you the only thing I'm going to brag about right now. When I chartered that boat, I took 16,000 people sailing and never lost a soul. So that's, I'm done bragging. But well, anyway. Dave, if, you was, would have, if you would have lost a soul in that 16,000 people, I'm not sure you'd ever be um, chartering again. Cause that's, <laughs> why that's why captains go down with the boat. I, that's, that was my point. <laughs> We're talking with Susan Wilzak Wood, who is a member of the crew for Serenade. And uh, maybe reminisce a little bit about the sailing. I, I was trying to get out of Dave a little bit, the sailing capacity for the boat. It was a beautiful boat, but it was also a very effective racing boat. Right. It was a, it was a, a effective racing boat, especially, you know, very early on. And as um, Dave was saying, uh, she just would handle great. And at any point of sail, you'd go after really. Uh, you know, I met Dave um, uh, when I first moved here in uh, 92, and he was teaching at uh, one of the local schools um, sailing class, sailing classes. And I was from the Detroit area, and I thought, oh, it'd be great to try to sailing. I'm looking at Lake Michigan. I need to be out there. And uh, so he was my uh, first instructor there. We had the school, the, went to the high school, and he did the classes. And then uh, the last class, we got to go to his boat to go sailing. Well, when you arrive at the marina and you see what he's talking about, I mean, we're all looking at each other like, oh my gosh, we're supposed to sail this? You know, we're trying to learn it, you know, in the classroom. And uh, uh, it just uh, hit it off uh, right from there. And uh, I was able to uh, go out on some of the, the charters with them. Uh, a few things, you know, handling the, the lines and so forth. But as he said, a lot of the times you needed a lot of the guys to do it. There's a lot of physicality that you need to, to sail with that. Um, so I helped a lot with just making uh, people feel very comfortable, helping to get into the slip, getting out of the slip, and, uh, uh, you know, things of, of that sort over the years. And just so fortunate to have had those great experiences. If you got on the boat... Even in the, when you when you were on it as a as a crew member, did you know that it was as old as it was? Yeah, you could tell easily. I mean, just the wood. We we learned about the history of it. Uh, just you know, everything was the brass. You know, it didn't look like any of the other fiberglass boats, and you know, that's for sure. And uh, you just had that sense, and it, just the smell of it. You were asking Captain Dave about you know what he thought about it, what he liked best about the boat. I just liked how it smelled. You could smell the varnish. You could just smell the water and you could smell that, that history in it, you know, and it was very distinct yeah. and very solid too. As he was saying, it really didn't move around. It was very stable uh, when you were on it. You felt good. A question I asked Dave that I never really got an answer to, but what was your favorite part of the boat? Well, my favorite part were, well, I like sitting at the helm when he let me sit at the helm <laughs> and just feel the boat under the your, the wheel. I mean, oh. that was probably the most spectacular from all of what he, he's had some other wooden boats too. And that's always uh, my, it, it's different. It just feels different. 
and you have so much uh, in front of you that in the sails, those magnificent sails above your head, you're just like, wow, you know. So I, I was able to do that. I think he let me do it just a couple times, but he was right there next to me. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, but it was, it was just uh, very majestic and, and so many great memories. And uh, I'm glad you're doing this because it's making me think of uh, the, the memories and, and we're reminiscing. So I've not been sailing with him every summer since 1992. So it goes to tell you, we've had a few little, <laughs> a lot of adventures together. <laughs> how, it was, how long, it was officially 63 feet? Actually it was 61 feet, 11 inches. Okay, how much did it weigh? Uh, Sixty-two thousand. I'm gonna ask a dumb uh, question: Is a wood boat heavier than a than a fiberglass boat? Oh yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that that can be changed too. Uh, it depends on the designer and what kind of wood you're using. And okay, would you now see the thing about the serenade? Uh, when we raced her, we were loaded down, always loaded down with people, books, uh, equipment. So this cut our speed down a little bit as far as racing with the big boys. Uh, the N class was never a very popular class. Now this boat raced when I had it in Newport. We had a they had a race, and they had 12 meters and all kinds of boats in it. There was 115 boats in that show, and we raced in that race. We came in seventh out of 115. But we do not we did not have new sails like a lot of boats had, and that makes a big difference. And also, it's tough to beat the old 12 meters. <laughs> Those no, it's. Well, plus they were stripped down versions of, of oh, yes. sleds, yeah. and, and you had a, a floating front room, for lack of a better right. term. Right, but, it, but she, she did well. She did well. She's fine. She moves along. And uh, uh, the thing that really, when you talk about something I really admired, I would say the canoe stern. You don't see a lot of canoe sterns. And, and Nick Pollard, he knew how to build that, so it was Perfect. It wasn't. This just wasn't a natural rounded off. You can see there's a point on that thing, and it was. I can remember sailing on that thing, and and we were heeled over, and the water was coming along that deck, and they would peel off that stern, beautiful, just kind of roll off. And I stood there and watched that. Now this didn't happen all the time. You know, sailing is is where you're out there and you have great days, and those are the days you remember. I'll give you an sure. example about the serenade. Let me tell you this. You know, we were out sailing a lot, and the Hobie cats had come out, and they used to sail circles around me, and, and they would laugh and carry on, but that was okay. They're a fast little boat. One day, we had the spinnaker up, and we were sailing down from South Haven, and we were going, we don't even know how fast we were going, and we came down past St. Joe, and out came the Hobie cats, and they were going to be, and we went <laughs> right past them. They just turned around and went back into the harbor. And that, when, but those are the days you remember. You don't remember the days it takes you 12 hours to get over to Chicago. You know. Was the Serenade a, a much better heavy wind, heavy air boat than a light air boat then? Oh, yes. Yes, it's a, it's a heavy boat, big heavy wooden boat. But but once, it got blown, once it got blown, it, was a, it performed obviously better. Oh, beautifully. Uh, you had to have wind. But again, if I'd had brand new sails, that would have made a little difference too. You know? But to buy new sails was... <laughs> You got to always keep in the back of your mind that Peggy and I are retired school teachers. No, I get that. And, and, what, what was the what was the ending with your tenure with the? How did your your tenure end with uh, with Serenade? Well, that's an interesting story too. Uh, at the at the end, towards the last three or four years, I had the boat. I was very fortunate enough. I used to go out and make a lot of speeches, and a couple of fellows came up and said, "Dave." Can we go in partnership with your boat? And I knew who they were. Uh, one of them, his father started Whirlpool, so there was no problem. In the, the other one told me one time he made $375,000 a day. So I said, by all means, you can be my partner. And they were just fine gentlemen. And they were my partners for three or four years, and that really helped. And uh, they, they, they wanted to be partners because they wanted to keep the boat in St. Joe to share it with the people of St. Joe at Benton Harbor. And we did. And uh, in about 1999, the boat was starting to show its wear. It had been almost 20 years since it had been restored. And uh, the Coast Guard said, Dave, I don't know how much longer we can let you sail this boat, we'll take people out because you've got some frames here starting to show a little wear. 
and you, you've got some problems here. Now, you can fix it. So the three of us sat down and talked about it, and we decided, let's sell it. So we sold it to a fellow from Hong Kong, and he took it into Maine, Camden, Maine, and had it restored. It cost him $500,000, which was a little bit over my head. But the, my gentleman could have handled it very easily. But they were aging out like me, and they decided they didn't want to keep it in St. Joe any longer. So we sold it to this man, and he had it for quite a few years. And then all of a sudden, uh, the boat was up for sale. And it sat in a, in a boathouse for maybe eight years, not even in the water. And then it got moving again. And I, I tried to keep track of it, but... You know, this boat has its own life and it sails all over the world. And uh, uh, when somebody gets on that boat and sails it, you're done. You don't find a finer boat to sail on. Do you remember your last sail on that boat? No. I have had so many sails on that boat, there was never a last one. Fair enough. Fair enough. What's your best memory to end this, this, this conversation? What was the, what's the thing that will stay with you? Um, until your last days about the boat? Probably the fact that I got it. That was the smartest thing I ever did do because the joy it brought to me, not only me, but to my family, to my friends, and to the Midwest. And I even had my daughter get married on it. And uh, so it was in the family also. I had great first mates. Greg Eversall was one of the, one of the finer ones. Uh, I don't like to mention a whole lot of names because uh, I'd forget somebody for sure. And I had a lot of first, good first mates. But the important thing was that everybody that sailed on it, I've seen them on the streets in St. Joe now, and they remember the day they sailed on the serenade. They sailed away, and it was beautiful, beautiful sailing with that girl. And uh, I wish I could tell you exactly, but we're talking 40, 35 years ago. Oh, I get it. And, and I think that's where I want to leave this at this point, because I think you've given us a flavor for the boat. And, and I'd like to leave you with one other thing. And I put these glasses on. Unfortunately, when I flew airplanes, they made me wear glasses, and I don't like wearing them. But, you know, I talked to you about risk. My wife and I have taken a lot of risks, not crazy ones, but I have to tell you how I talked to her one time. She said, Dave, this has been wonderful. I've had a wonderful life with you. I love you very much. We've had great children. It's been great. But when I die and go to heaven, I'm going to have a good, good talk with the Lord, good Lord. And I'm going to ask you, do we have to stay with our mates on earth? She said, once in a lifetime is enough. And so that's, that's how she was. And so that was that. Now, let me finish off here. Like I said, we took risks. In my readings over the years, I've come across a couple of sentences that set me back to think. And I'll read them to you. Taking risks involves the possibility of defeat and pain. And also the possibility of joy and fulfillment. Some of us learn early in life to risk much. Some don't. Others take years to risk our lives for ourselves, for our loved ones, and especially for Jesus Christ. And that's like I like to leave you that way. This, this didn't all happen. We, Peggy and I, have been blessed by the good Lord all our life. This just didn't happen. But it happened. Okay. And we loved it. Well, listen, I appreciate your time. Welcome back to Inside Great Lakes Sailing. My name is Greg Norman. We're talking with uh, a couple of, of really good Cal 25 sailors and Paul Nectar 9 and John McAllister. As you're aware, that the first part of the show, we talked a little bit about a 38-foot uh, boat built in 1938. So we're kind of talking about boats and construction and not necessarily personality. So the simplest of questions is always the easiest one to ask, and that's what I want to ask. Cal 25s built here right in Michigan, I think designed by a gentleman by the name of Lapworth, who was a University of Michigan graduate. About 2,000 boats were built. What is so popular about the Cal 25? And there are some unbelievable places like Long Island, like uh, New Orleans, and even Detroit and Port Huron. There's, it's, it seems to be a, a really solid boat. And maybe explain why. 
it's a great family both to start off with. And uh, Paul's been in the class longer than I have. He can probably tell you more about the, the family lineages than, than I can. Yeah, when I bought my boat, I saw it and I knew that the Cal 25 was a boat that a lot of people were racing. They had a strong racing class, but it was also a great family boat. I bought my, mine's a 68, but I bought it in 78. Um, my dad, when I told my dad I bought a Cal 25, he said, that son could possibly be the worst decision you ever made. <laughs> and he was from a farm community. He was born in the 20s. I took him sailing twice. And he says, son, that could possibly be the best decision you ever made. So, And uh, he learned to uh, sail and race on a Cal 25. I took him out multiple times. He loved it. We went out and stayed overnight on the boat. But since then, my son grew up on the boat. And now his son right now is sailing with him. So multiple generations. And it's not just my boat. On Monday nights, probably the best sailing that we do. We have a lot of father and son teams just come out there because we double hand. It's very special to me. John, what do you do? Well, oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I got in the class. It was uh, my wife and I were sailing snipes competitively, but you drive a long ways to you know get to a regatta. And in fact, the last regatta that I went to, um, actually the year before I went to that regatta, um, the boat never got off the trailer. We sat there for two days waiting for the wind pick up, never picked up. So two days at the regatta, no racing. We come home, bummer. So the last time I went there, several years ago, um, again, first day, boat never got off the trailer. Second day, wind came up. Everybody launches their boats, go out. We're chasing the wind all day. Never got a race off. Needless to say, we're bummed. Had to pack up the boat, come home. And uh, my wife, Tracy's like, you know, isn't there a class nearby that you can get into that we would have fun racing? And so I started asking around. And uh, this is actually before I knew Paul. Um, met up with John Harper, good friend of ours. Uh, he's in the class. And he told me the Cal 25 class was the, the biggest, most competitive and friendly, friendliest class here in Detroit. So we started doing some research and sure enough, we got into the boat. And I remember as a junior looking at Cal 25's racing, I thought I'd never get in the class. You know, it's a big, heavy, slow boat. But I tell you what, now that I've got the boat, I'm in the class. There's nothing more fun to race. And the people that are racing the boats are exceptionally friendly and uh, more than willing to help anybody out, you know, if they're going slow or if they're new to the class, you know, anything I'm from rigging to making the boat go fast, just general maintenance, whatever. So it's a, it's a great, solid class. Now, Bill Lapworth was credited with starting the, uh, oh, my gosh, the Flying Scots. He was the guy who designed the Flying Scots. The, now, when I look at a Cal 25, I see a flat top. Mm -hmm. I see a 4,000-pound weight. On it, so can you? You can't stand up. I've never actually been in one. You can't stand up in them, can you? Oh, down below. Well, yeah. it does have a yeah. It has a pop-up hatch, so when you okay. put that up, you can. But yeah, yeah. I don't think my hatch has been popped up in twenty years. Okay, and <laughs> never so, ever used it. So it's just comfortable down below. Right, talk about the racing part of it, and you know, I, I think of J twenty fours, and I think of through the years. Certain boats have had this sort of real hot image for a while, and they have these great fleets. This boat's been around in, in, in very specific fleets, and it hasn't lost its luster. And there's sort of a cult-like process to the way you guys treat your boats. But more importantly, just the community of Cal 25 is really different than I think most of the, most of the fleets that are out there. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely. I remember when they came out, it was a really hot little Morsi boat. And uh, one of the early boats that have a fin sticking down from the bottom, they probably thought that that's never going to last. Maybe that a boat will be around for a few years. Obviously, I just had a 50 year birthday party for my boat. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's going well. When people come from out of town and see the Detroit boats, probably because we have to put them away in the winter. We fix them up every year, the boats get better and better. And these are beautiful Cal 25s. Some of them look like better than brand new. Yeah, to I, that point, to that point, I mean, everybody that buys the boats and us too, when I first got the boat, 
he was in decent shape, but to be competitive, you know, I've got this thing where you got to get rid of all the excuses. One is if the boat's not in good shape, fix it. So, you know, I took it in, had it professionally fared and uh, got new sails, you know, just got the boat competitive and went out race and did fairly well. But that's just indicative of everybody in the class. And the nice thing about the Cal 25 is you don't have to spend a lot of money. You know, you get in for a, a, a easy fee, you spend a little bit of money to fix it up, and you are you are competitive. You can you you'd be capable of going out and actually winning races. John, I've seen the, I've seen the side of your boat, and I've seen the top of your boat, and I've made a comment on this show. <laughs> I've heard. I've heard. <laughs> the side looks like it's you know showroom ready, like it just rolled off some great mm-hmm. boat factory someplace, and you know I'm not sure that if I compared your boat with PT109 as it stands today on the top of the boat. But my, my, my real question is, I, looked, I just looked through the, some of the um, for sale places and stuff. And you can buy Cal 25s for as low as four or five grand to maybe up to 10 or 12,000. So my question is to you, too. Yeah. right, but I'm, I'm saying you said that you, know, you, you put money. Have you put, yeah. and I'm not asking for a specific number, but have you put thousands of dollars into your boat or tens of thousands of dollars in your boat? Thousands. Okay. So it doesn't take that much to be a competitive racer in that class, right? right? right Most right. people in the class fix the boats up themselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the class is very strong where if you have a project going, many Cal 25 sailors will come to your aid and all work on the project together. And that yeah. includes even uh, getting it up to speed, tuning the rig. John and I spend a lot of time getting out and sailing with other people who are a little bit slower in the class and want to learn, and we will bring them up to speed as quick as we can. What makes the boat so competitive? More importantly, what do you like about it as a racing boat? Oh, I, I got to go first on that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a simple boat. It's simple to rig. It's simple to understand. <clears throat> so the focus then is tactics, boat speed, just the bare basics that you have to excel at. You always have to be good at looking at the wind, telling what the conditions are, what's happening on the water. Um, Again, we talk about getting the boats, you you know, you're in skiing, you know, if you're racing cars, you know, you spend a certain amount in the boats race ready. If you spend a lot more, you'll get maybe some very small incremental speed out of that to the point where is it even worth it? Maybe. But the thing is, all the boats are basically equal. You can take the best boat in the fleet, put a, a mediocre crew on it, take the worst boat in the fleet, put a good crew on it, and that worst boat is going to end up winning. It will. So that's, that's what makes the boats so so great to race. It's and good. they're simple. Go ahead, Paul. I think, I think you can bring almost any Cal 25 um, right off the dock and get it out sailing and racing, and you're going to be in the hunt. Now, there's some of them that are fixed up a little bit better, maybe in what I call in the arms race, which I refuse to be in. <laughs> <laughs> and they just have inherent speed from their new sails, things like that, and the ability just to adjust sail shape quicker. If it's easy to do, then you'll do it. You'll do it, yeah. Yeah. I'm not a naval architect, but this boat's 25 feet long, yet when it's listed, it's listed as having a length of water of only 20 feet. Does that five feet, that's really unusual as compared to a lot of other formulas. Does that short water line help maybe speed change direction easier? I don't think that Cal 25s are known for their speed. In fact, (laughs) they're a little bit tough to push through the water, which means you have to pay attention to keeping boat speed to maximum at all times. You're always making adjustment, changing gears constantly in order to keep the boat going. When you mentioned family, you're referring to racing and not necessarily cruising. Is that a fair statement? Oh, both. Both. Oh, both. Our, our boat is known to leave the dock almost every day. And it's either taking wives out, friends out. My son, when he was younger, college, he would have there would be kids going out every night. Trace, I will be going out on his boat here soon because we pulled mine just a couple of days ago. So we'll just be sailing after work as many nights as we can yet this summer. And my boat is also a really good fishing boat. We pull a lot of pike, muskie, bass, perch, walleye out and just uh, fishing off the boat. 
Do you have optional downriggers someplace on that that we don't know about towards the back? <laughs> no, I would. I'm thinking about installing them though. That would be nice. I like to see it installed on the bottom of this keel <laughs> if we could do that. <laughs> My friends who are fishermen keep telling me that the downriggers would be great on a sailboat. The problem is sometimes the, the fish is large and you got to go backwards with the boat to fight the fish. So unless you're willing to drown the fish by dragging it as you're going in one direction, it changes the kind of the, the, the process. Um, go ahead. In this class, when I look back over the years, there are so many friends that are, that are lifelong friends that I've met just in this class. And John is a good example. When he recently came into the class, we became fierce competitors. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and the other side, we are best of friends. Yep. I think that every couple nights we get together just to do something. If we can sail together, we will, or we'll go out to dinner together. So uh, the, these boats have brought a lot of good friends together. Indeed. If you're on your cal, is there, is there weather limitations that you worry about? If I'm on a 40-foot boat, I have a different expectation if I'm on a 20-foot boat, obviously. But is there, with, with Lake St. Clair, do you worry about weather? Is there, a, is there a limit to how far you can go with the boat? I would say, I would say no, no, but personally, I don't like taking the boat out when it's blown over 25. Okay. I think 25 is good. A small boat, though, you can get in and out, and you can man manhandle it easier. I think it's just an easier boat just to get out and sail for the evening. Mm -hmm. I want to buy one. Where do I look first? Well, I'm sorry, what's the question? If you buy a boat, Cal 25. Where would I start looking? Just local boatyards? Uh, well, you, that logo that you have behind you, the Cal 25 website, that'd be the first place to go. All um, look on the classifieds. Next thing. Contact any Cal 25 sailor, and we'll definitely get you hooked up with somebody that's selling a boat. Yep. Can you can you put into words, and you may not be able to, but can you put into words what it is that just, you know, I ask the question a lot in these interviews of when, do you remember when, you know, that first hook into your brain that you knew that sailing was a lifelong avocation? So I'm going to ask the question in a slightly different way to the two of you. What is it about that boat that if you were trying to explain it to a Martian, what is it about that boat that is so special to you? It's, hard me, it's, it's racing with my wife. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's it. You know, we get to go out, we get to sail the boat. It's small enough. Like um, we used to do Monday nights, the double handed together. That was a lot of fun. And there aren't a whole lot of, you know, husband, wife teams racing together. So I'd, I'd say that's pretty special. Yeah. That's the people that I've sailed with on these boats. When my son came along, he thought the boat started with him. And then I showed him a journal of all the people that sailed on the boat before he even got there. <laughs> well, like yesterday, Greg, my son was asking, well, Dad, when can I steer this boat? I said, well, when you're tall enough where you can actually see over that flat <laughs> deck, you got to be able to see first. And I, he called me on the day that he could actually see over that deck. And he started steering sense. He's a great sailor. Yeah, he is. Did they ever make Cal 25s with a wheel instead of a tiller? Were they all tillers? Uh, all tillers, but I think I've seen a custom picture or a, a custom boat in a picture with a wheel. People have fixed them up and sailed all over the world with a family and, you know, and did uh, self-schooling and everything on these boats. So. I find it really interesting and heartfelt that when, when you talk to you both collectively or, or individually, it's you can just see how much you love your boat you know if somebody would ask me about my boat as to what i love about it the most i would have to simply say it's paid for so it doesn't it doesn't cost me a lot other than what you have to come yeah. with yeah but that's true of, of any boat that we all own it's that it's that large black hole in the water i just don't i have not seen and that's why we're having a conversation with you i have not witnessed the uh fervor of of, of, a, of a class Maybe at the closest thing to it is maybe 20 years ago, J-24s, and the way people fought of those boats. And I think it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable to be able to see this and see these boats still sailing. He obviously did a heck of a job uh, designing it. And, you know, just, it's just fun to listen to have these conversations. So I, I really do appreciate your time. I personally Anything. can't believe it. Yeah, that they've still held together all this time. Mm -hmm. And they're, I, I think 
I believe that they're settling faster than they ever have even probably, in the past. Probably. Just two mechanical questions. What typically, if it weighs 4,000 pounds, can you get away with a three or four horse engine on the back to get you out? Oh, yeah. You could. What's it rated uh, for? The minimum you can have for racing is six horse. Okay. That's one of our class rules. Yeah, that's actually a, a, a bylaw in the Detroit area. Mm -hmm. And I think that's more so we can get up to Port Huron and get underneath the bridge and get out and race with those guys. Where the national rule is a five horse. Right. Not that it matters, but one horsepower. One of the old jokes, Greg, is if you buy a brand new six horse engine, you get the boat with it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as you pointed out, there's I did see some boats online that were in the you know twenty five hundred dollar range, and I I saw pictures and it looked like the pictures were taken from Chicago at some point because they weren't real up close. But <laughs> if you're paying two grand for a boat, you get what you get. So I, I get that yeah. part. And what you what you will be faced with, the are a depth, deck stepped mast. There's nothing underneath that mast, so there's a wooden beam that's laminated under. It goes from side to side in the boat. Once you replace that wooden beam, it's a brand new boat. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's probably the most crucial part of it. Yeah. Well, that's because you start putting the back stay on. If that beam is soft, you're just pushing the mass into the hull as opposed to putting pressure or, you know, tightening your force stay. Yeah. Last so question. That would, be, that would be stage one on a two thousand dollar cal 25 yep. most likely that beam is going to need to be replaced in fact a friend of ours that just got in the class this year his beam failed in the uh bod race and we've been on his boat brian shenstone too trying to help him out and uh actually it just turned out i got a note from him that sarns is going to fix it for him this winter mm -hmm. but yeah like paul said once that beam's in place pretty much you're 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 almost ready to race Right. Now you just need some good sales. There's some local beams from uh, really good uh, uh, boat builders that have laminated this wood together that are ready to go, and you could just go buy one for not that much money. One of the conversations I keep having again through this series is that there are just more. There's more talent than I think people sometimes recognize, and I've said this in almost every interview we've done. And it seems the Cal 25, I know you've mentioned some guys at Bayview and I've mentioned those guys to other sailors in the area and stuff. There's a very strong quality of racer in the Cal 25 fleet. You guys would be two representatives in that, in that class. So it does attract, doesn't it, it's not attracting guys like me, it's attracting guys like you who are truly really good sailors. So you guys must know something the rest of us don't. So to that extent, you, I'm, I'm assuming that, it's it, it's it's a good thing from you from your standpoint because you have really competitive races we do yeah when you For look sure. over who's who on the line of a cal 25 big regatta it's pretty amazing i always say i love racing with my friends and when they have great talents it's even better cool well listen i appreciate your time and i think this will be a good addition to the story and i think it gives us some some insight to uh, both Cal 25s and a little bit about uh, the uh, the love and passion that you have for your, your fleet. So I appreciate your time. No, thanks for asking. Us. Great thanks, Greg. Yeah.